I'll make sure I don't screw this one up, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to Journey 41. Today, I have Elena Dogan on the podcast. Really excited about this conversation. A lot of cool different things we're going to go into. Uh, but to start us off, I'm going to get you to introduce yourself. So Elena, the floor is yours. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, you know, who you are, where you're from, uh, what you do, everything like that. Hi, Jared. Thank you so much for having me on. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Elena. I, I'm from Turkey, Istanbul. I grew up there and lived there until I moved to New York for college, where I was really interested in philosophy and psychology and technology and intersections of all these three. So I studied, I made my own major and I studied technology ethics, which then later led me to crypto. And I love thinking about and writing about these topics right now. And yeah, I, I work at Mania NFT as a copywriter and social strategist and uh, publish newsletters. And I just love thinking and writing about Web3. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And, um, you know, I'm curious a little bit, even just going back to your experiences growing up in Turkey and, you know, the differences. And, you know, I feel like a lot of, especially people that I've talked to and, um, you know, from what little I have seen of the space, like especially the Web3 space, a lot of, you know, very North American centered uh, people and people from North America. So I'm curious if you think that growing up in Turkey has changed your uh, perspective on things and in what ways? And um, do you feel like there is a lot of North American centric, um, you know, thinking in, in the industry? Yeah, moving from Istanbul to New York wasn't such a big change in terms of both of them being very big cities. And I think even last five, six years, I see the, the change even more uh, in terms of Web3, for example. And maybe you can um, sympathize with that as well in terms of you know situation in, the, in my home country and how the economy got really bad in the recent years, which led a lot of Turkish people to also consider crypto, for example. So crypto is kind of big in Turkey due to this. Uh, when the, the current market in our own country is not so stable and um, you know not so trustworthy, perhaps, people, I think, try to find additional uh, places to put their income or invest in. So in crypto, I think Turkish people are really interested in it, um, but definitely there's a huge problem in crypto where representation is not where it should be. Uh, I think um, more so with gender, especially, where uh, most of the people are you know, white, male, um, usually middle-aged people, or, um, or getting, getting there. Um, Sorry, there's a helicopter out. <laughs> hey, I, should have, I should have closed the window. Um, <laughs> right. But yeah, it's definitely giving me a different perspective because I could compare the situation in Turkey and US. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll kind of circle back a little bit, um, you know, more to the Web3 space a little bit later. But, um, you know, moving to New York, was that always something that you wanted to do from a young age? Or was it as you got older, that was something that became more... Um, you know, something that you wanted to do more? And was it always specifically New York slash America or were you looking at other places too? It was mainly America. I wanted to come here for college because I always thought the best education was here. And uh, especially because I, I've always been so interested in tech from little, you know, from age 10 maybe. And I was so interested in Web2 companies and I felt like I missed that boat because all these companies are already huge. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's actually like very exciting to be working in Web3 because it's a new frontier that I can participate in. But as the tech hub, I think America um, compared to other countries are, it's, it's always going to be a little more, not necessarily ahead, but more people working on it and more enterprises and new startups happening. Very cool. And do you remember what 
got you into technology? Like, do you remember that first thing? Was it a parent or was it like a specific TV show or movie or was it anything like that? Do you remember what kind of kicked off that interest in technology? I'm not really sure, actually. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I've just, ever since I known myself, I, it's funny because I wanted to be a writer and then I turned into, uh, I want to work in tech. And then I ended up writing about tech. <laughs> so I didn't <laughs> plan to. <laughs> yeah. And what about, what about on the writing side? Cause I know you do a lot of writing. You said you're a copywriter at uh, Vayner NFT. Um, you know, I've, I've read a couple of your articles and um what about the writing? Like, when did you first gravitate towards writing? Um, yeah, and just so you know, when did it really kind of take hold and realize that it's going to be a big part of your life moving forward? I think it started with my interest in philosophy. Okay, I wasn't really um, sort of. I wasn't a writer that's more like fiction, or I, I don't like to do all the, you know, sparkles in, in, a, in a text, but I like writing very, it's very straightforward and explaining ideas and just the, the beauty of how you write a philosophy paper, how one argument follows the next. And it's just like this beautiful argument writ in written format that really got to me. And uh, I started studying philosophy in my third year at college. And um, that's when I actually started loving writing. And then uh, my first stuff that I wrote was always more philosophy based about consciousness, about, you know, uh, ethics. Um, but then I, after I got interested in, in NFTs and MF3, I wasn't even trying to be a journalist or anything, but I just wanted to create a resource with my newsletter for people who, might not have the access to information as much as I did. So that was the motivation behind behind it. And that kind of just, yeah, developed naturally. Very cool. And so, you know, with Web3, then, um, you know, you talked about how you felt like you almost missed the boat on Web2. And um, do you remember the first time that you stumbled across Web3? And was it a cryptocurrency or or what exactly was it? And um, yeah, I guess we'll start with that. And then I have a follow up after that. Yes, I do have a very distinct memory, actually. I was, it was my first semester at college. I was part of a club that was doing like first year entrepreneurship program. Um, you know, it would take us to like Google HQ and, and all these different startups. And I remember being on the subway going to a WeWork to meet with a company and somebody were, was saying, oh, blockchain, et cetera. And I thought, well, wait, what is that? <laughs> um, and I you know, had kind of an idea about it, but I didn't really dove into it. So that was like the first, okay, let me learn about this. Um, yeah. And then that kind of, you know, two years later, i worked at a company. Two years later, I completely dove into the into the space so it was uh kind of gradual very cool because i know that you said you kind of made your own um major when you're in college there and so was it early on that you realized you wanted to kind of focus on that because it was your first year then you said that you you uh first got into that or was it more of a okay i want to work i want to write about tech i'm gonna make my own um, you know, major so I can really focus on it. And then it just gradually turned into focusing on web three. Can you kind of walk me through that on how that kind of gradually came about? Yeah, sure. I really didn't want to write at all at first. I was really interested in entrepreneurship. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Even now I see myself more, more as a builder rather than writer, but, uh, in the point of my career, you know, I, um, you start somewhere and um, you learn through that as well. So I, I am grateful for all the you know, writing opportunities I have. Um, but yeah, I was, I was um, interested in being an entrepreneur, building uh, just startups. I was in the entrepreneurship scene a lot. And then um, I got more 
apart from that for a minute when I more dove into philosophy and psychology. And I was really interested in how our minds work, how we perceive the world around us and um, how that is creating our experience. Uh, that was more kind of, I, I personally wanted to understand that for myself um, because you know, you go through a lot of different things at college and I wanted to kind of understand myself better actually. So yeah. that's, that's what motivated me. So I took, I started with psychology and then um, I would take, you know, marketing courses to understand how that affects our, our minds. I did, you know, internet addiction. Um, and then after merging psychology with philosophy and seeing understanding the knowing how to ask those questions with philosophy and then having the data the you know neuroscience data or or being able to write uh, read those research papers so i could cite them in the philosophy papers that i wrote that gave um kind of like a proof to those uh, philosophical thoughts so that was really interested and then i finally added the tech twist to that um after you know a year year and a half of focusing fully on that area and then realize, okay, how can we live a good life? How can we understand ourselves? But in this technological age that we're in, because, you know, how to live a good life, that's a question that's been asked for hundreds of years from earliest philosophers. But now I think it requires another take because we're living in this technology age when technology is growing exponentially our brain is very slow because it goes through evolutions and it's a very slow process so how can we mitigate that how can we make sure that our minds that are you know used to seeing 500 people in the village that they lived in and how can they how can that brain be okay with you know thousands of people seeing your story on instagram or feeling like you're being judged by everyone online. So I think that that was such an interesting thought that I I, I thought, oh, like we need to pay attention to this <laughs> because sure. it's, it's having an effect. Yeah, and you know it's it's interesting because I I've never thought about it in those terms necessarily before, but it's it's so true. Where I, I do feel like a lot of the talk around you know, um, especially, you know, some of the historical philosophies or how to, you know, live um, a good life, how to, you know, incorporate wellness. And a lot of times it's almost ignoring the fact that technology is so omnipresent in our lives of we're not going to get away from it. You can minimize it, you can use it in different ways. Technology evolves, of course, but, you know, it's not going to just go away. And so ignoring it or not factoring it in is, is really important in my opinion. And so I'm, yeah, I, I really, I really enjoy that take actually. I agree. Yeah. And so um, I love that. And so, you know, an another thing that I really liked, and I think that a lot of people struggle with it is you're saying of, you know, your interest in entrepreneurship, you, you still do see yourself more as a builder as opposed to an author. Um, however, this is the path that you're taking right now to learn, to do different things. You have opportunities here. And I think that that's something that not a lot of people are willing to do. Uh, they have a very like rigid, you know, view in their mind of I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this. And if it doesn't look exactly like that, um, then they just fight against it. And I feel like a lot of times that's how people get stuck. Um, do you think that, you know, do you notice that of a lot of people being very rigid in their thinking and not going without or outside of those lines? And was it always easy for you to do things a little bit differently or to be flexible in your thinking? Or do you even consider yourself that way? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think I, I feel like, you know, as a international person working in the U.S., um, there's a lot of things that I have to think about and plan towards, you know, in terms of visa, sponsorship, work, et cetera. So I, and I personally, like in my family, I don't have anyone who works in tech. I never really had like a mentor. So I thought I had to kind of find that inside me in a sense. Mm -hmm. 
I, you know, I always saw myself being somewhere um, in, you know, building something that would have positive effect into the world, um, something that I can, I can be proud to be working towards. But I don't think it's that easy. I even, I think what I'm noticing right now is that, yes, it is hard. And I see a lot of people I know who, you know, a lot of like other international people who I've studied with, uh, who can't really do this capitalistic system because it requires so much from us and um, it's too much for them. And then they either go back or, you know, have, have some support system that can help them. Um, I, I am, of course, like I have a lot of you know, my family, et cetera, supporting me, but I, th I always thought I was a little different in thinking and uh, different in my interests just because, I mean, I, I'm the only person in my family to study abroad and live abroad um, and to like show that initiative from young age. So I think it's it's difficult. Like I, I struggle with it too. I just try to wake up and kind of push through and, you know, motivate myself because I feel like a lot of people miss the point of actual work. <laughs> That's what I noticed recently. And it's like in myself too, it's like, if you want to do something, the amount of work that goes into it is actually like way more than what we imagine, I think. And that is something that's not really taught at school. So yeah, that's, that's challenging. Yeah. I think, I think, you know, just like you said, it's a point that's missed a lot of times is that, you know, people think that it should just be easier. It should just happen and you don't have to put the work into it. You don't have to do anything. Um, and yeah, it's been, it's something that I've noticed a lot in my life too. Um, now, you know, kind of going into a big interest of you and what you work in is you know the web three um call it do, domain whatever you know, how, however you want to phrase it um but specifically nfts and you know something that i have uh been very curious about for the last you know call it probably a year now and learning about um have a couple of them but it is still something that's so new and so misunderstood by um i'd say the vast majority of people and so just kind of, you know, diving a little bit into that and starting even with just like the basic uh, basics of, can you explain, I guess, in your own words, one, what Web3 is, and then two, specifically, what an NFT is? Okay, sure. So um, Web3 in itself uh, is the new iteration of the internet. So web one is what we called for um, internet that was only read function. So it would be Yahoo, for example, you would go and learn about the information. And then after, uh, after that, there was the social media companies, what we called then web 2.0. Now we kind of call it web two. Uh, and that was these huge companies are, could accrue the value that we created and they could monetize that. But we didn't own anything. We could write it as well as read it. So we could consume the information and we could also provide information. So we provided content for these platforms. And now with Web3, which is a, a term that we use, but uh, we're not completely there yet, which is important to note, and there is, really not a single correct definition uh, because we really don't know what it's going to end up looking like. Um, it's the read function, the, the write function, but now we get to own. We get to own our creations. We get to own our data. And when we participate in certain platforms or certain projects, we actually have monetary incentive to care and and participate and we have ownership of our own lives on our, our our own digital lives which is a revolutionary thing because this is the first time that it, that there is scarcity in, in in the internet which we can tie to nfts because nft in its in itself um it's not just a jpeg <laughs> 
I feel like a lot of people think that. How I like to describe it is as a box. So you can think an NFT, which is primarily a block on the blockchain as a box. And the image you see is just pasted on one side so you can identify what it is more easily. But all the different utilities, different perks, different you know airdrops, everything that can come with an NFT, you can think of you know things that you put in that box. And when you buy that, you take all of that. Hmm. I think that's a way of thinking about the concept, but as like a more um, technical definition, it's a certificate of authenticity. So for the first time in the digital world, which we spend our lives more and more, uh, we could have one of something. You can copy paste that picture as many times as you want, but similar to how there's one Mona Lisa, and if you own Mona Lisa, even if someone forges it or if someone steals it, you can still show that it's yours. Similar to that, you can showcase that you own a digital item through uh, the, the smart contract that is written on blockchain that no one can change because it's immutable. And it's also transparent, which creates a you know, huge difference from Web2 because we could we can now um, have a transparency in art world, for example, which is something that we never had. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for explaining that. I really like the ball. And I'm currently like thinking about why I put that much pressure on myself and thinking maybe even, you know, I have an older brother, like growing up with a brother, maybe that is, you know, has a part in that. Just trying to figure out the why, but I think practically what I'm trying to do while I you know, focus on the why as well is to take life a little less seriously in a sense um, while doing what I need to do, maybe being more okay if something goes wrong or, you know, doing this podcast, maybe like if I, if I say something wrong, not dwelling on it and not like being angry at myself, but, but being okay with, okay, you, you did it anyway. So I think it's so important to go out and fail and take that chance because you never know who you can meet, what you can do, what that can open up to. So I feel like I push myself towards trying new things a lot, but I, I was usually more anxious doing it, but I would still do it because, you know, I have to. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and now I try to do it, but also hopefully enjoy it. <laughs> for sure. You know, it's a, a journey. Oh, for sure. And, you know, one, one thing that helped me a lot was redefining failure, right? Of, and almost thinking of it as every time I go out and do something, it's to learn. It's not to quote unquote succeed or, or fail. It's to learn. And if I'm learning, then I am succeeding. And so even if I, if I screw up, if I fuck up, whatever it might be, it's learning and taking that I'm like, oh, <laughs> you know, that's not what not to do or, okay, that's how I got myself into that situation. And just being able to take a learning um, from every interaction and everything, especially those things that scare us um, so that it doesn't feel like that quote unquote failure. Yeah, I think looking back to, I feel like we always realize that something that's so difficult in the, at that moment and, um, I went through probably the most difficult two months of my life this year with some personal stuff that I was dealing with, with visa, things that I mentioned and work and just, it was just a lot. And I think just um, being okay with if things are not okay. And at least like, even, even if it doesn't feel like that at that moment, you know, in a couple months or even, you know, whatever, however long that time is needed. When you look back, I always find myself looking at the situation. Okay, that was actually a good thing that happened to me. But it never feels like that at that moment. It never does. Yeah. So when when I was going through that, actually, a friend of mine said to me, um, you know, God or whatever anyone believes, like, wouldn't put your put you through something that it knows that you can't go through. 
So that, that really touched me at that time. Cause I thought, okay, like I can find a strength in me to deal with whatever I have to deal with. And hopefully at the end of it, when I go through it, it's going to be a brighter side because I put all that effort into it. I love that. I love that so much. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think, I think, uh, a real shift for me as well was looking back on some of the hardest uh, points in my life and getting to a place where I could actually genuinely be grateful for them, for the lessons that they taught me. And, you know, through my journey and lots of therapy and looking back and seeing things in my childhood that, you know, were extremely difficult and, um, yes, did, did cause a lot of negatives in my life and led to negatives. Truly looking back on it, I can be thankful for those things, for the lessons that they taught me. And um, I like to nickname them my superpowers of going through those allowed me, um, you know, my quote unquote superpowers that I have today. And truly being thankful for those. And yes, they suck in the moment a lot of times, um, but knowing that you can get through it and knowing that you'll come out stronger on the other end for it. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like I also see, you know, I, I noticed first on, on myself and then I think related to how much technology we're integrated in, I, I find myself not giving myself, you know, any time to stop. <laughs> I feel like, you know, jumping from one thing to another, running around, and especially if there's a negative feeling inside, that helps with not dealing with that feeling and, you know, yeah. always finding a distraction or something to ease or just blur it. And uh, I, I guess I'm curious how you look at that because I feel like that's something that's, at least for me, major for me. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I think, I think that there's a lot of different roles that technology plays for different people. And a lot of times it's, you know, what they're trying to run away from or what they're dealing with or whatever it might be. Um, I know for myself specifically, um, avoidance was a huge thing for me. And same now, you know, similar to you, uh, however, you know, of distracting myself. If I have things going on, there's no stopping, there's no pausing, there's no, you know, actually, you know, going through it, dealing with it. For me, it was through work a lot of times of my entire life, I've worked extremely hard and a ton, which is amazing. However, going back and really digging into it, I realized that it was so that I didn't have to deal with a lot of the things that were going on. Of uh, You know, if I worked 80 hours in a week, 100 hours in a week, I didn't have to deal with my feelings. I didn't have to look at those things that were bugging me. And so, um, and realizing that that it was the avoidance that, you know, whether it's watching TV, playing video games, being on social media, um, you know, asking myself why and really pausing and checking in with myself was something that I had to add into my life and something that even now when I am starting to, you know, go into a little bit of avoidance or when I'm dealing with something or a little bit even of just a low period uh, for myself. I feel myself gravitating towards those things, things to numb out, things to distract myself. And so for me, it was really being aware um, of it, really being aware of it, noticing it, checking in with myself once I noticed it. Um, I do little things. Uh, I do try to do a morning routine, um, which, you know, sometimes I do and mm -hmm. a lot of times I don't. But, you know, part of that for me is journaling. Um, in the morning and forcing myself to sit there for five minutes and just write whatever comes up and it's completely different. And even if I sit there and write, I do not want to write anything right now, forcing myself to do that just to, again, like have that silence, take that, you know, those couple minutes to check in of like, what am I actually thinking of what's coming up in me right now, instead of just, you know, going on my phone so that I don't have to think about it. And so for almost forcing myself to take those moments to take and, you know, build those habits uh, was something that I, I have started to do and has helped me. Yeah, that's really great. It's, I, I try to do as much possible too, but of course not every day. And, <laughs> <Yeah. you> know, <laughs> it's funny how 
how much time we have during the day, but not five minutes for meditation. You know, can't find the, that five minutes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can always find excuses not to do it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I am on a little bit of a time crunch. I know we're having an amazing conversation. Um, so unfortunately, we will have to cut this a little bit short. But uh, before I let everybody go, um, you know, is... I guess first, is there anything that we didn't get to? I know that you have a couple projects on the go if you wanted to talk about any of those. And then just the best place for people to find you, to follow you, to connect with you um, if they're interested in finding out more. Of course. Yeah, you can um, reach out to me via my Twitter at Elena underscore ETH uh, in terms of Ethereum. Um, and you can email me at Elena.nftimes if at gmail.com if you have any questions i'm so happy to educate and if you have any questions about nfts web3 you know ethical tech i'm so happy to talk about it and um if you want to learn more too you can subscribe to my newsletter nf times at nftimes.substack.com and yeah just come build at web3 it's so much fun it's great and um yeah thank you for having me Thank you so for so ah sorry thank you so much for being on Thank you